Welcome to Knowledge Wins, your podcast from the U.S. Army John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center and School and the Special Operations Center of Excellence, where we explore topics to enable a more holistic understanding of the Army's Special Operations Forces Schoolhouse and the role of Army Special Operations in the future of national defense. I'm your host, Major Anthony Wirtz, a Psychological Operations Officer by trade and a member of the Commander's Initiative Group here at the Special Warfare Center and School. What you hear in these episodes are the views of the participants and don't represent those of SWIC, the Army, or any other agency of the U.S. government. It's my pleasure to introduce today's guest, Colonel Stuart Ferris, is the commander of the 1st Special Warfare Training Group, whose mission is to assess, select, train, and qualify U.S. Army civil affairs, psychological operations, and special forces soldiers in order to provide the United States Army Special Operations Command with the capability to conduct worldwide special operations. Colonel Ferris commissioned as an armor officer in 1997 and served his platoon leader time and troop executive officer time there before joining Special Forces, excuse me, in fall of 2000. Since then, he's commanded at every level from operational detachment command through group command, mainly with the 3rd Special Forces Group to include six deployments to Afghanistan. He commanded the 1st Battalion, 1st Special Warfare Training Group here at the Special Warfare Center and School responsible for the Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape course, numerous Special Forces field and tactics training courses, and the assessment and selection courses for all three branches. When he wasn't commanding, he held numerous operations officer positions from the battalion through the two-star command level. Today's episode is entitled Surviving Selection. It's one for anyone interested in an Army, joining an Army Special Operations branch, which are, of course, as you know, civil affairs, PSYOP, or special forces. This discussion is going to be geared to help those interested folks in the active force, the National Guard or Reserves, or anyone out in the civilian world considering entering RSOF with a direct enlistment contract. It's also a good listen for any family members whose soldier is thinking about attending or about to attend. So before we delve into the topic, sir, welcome. Pleasure to have you here. Hey, thanks, Anthony. Likewise, yep. man. Pleasure to be here. This is my first podcast, man. So it's a bucket list. I'm able to check, but keep your expectations low. Hey, sir. We're, we're all, it's all team <laughs> effort here. Yep. We appreciate it. Um, jumping in, I like to ask our guests if you could tell us a little bit about yourself uh, beyond that intro. Uh, specifically, sir, what motivated you to change the direction of your Army career and decide to try out for Special Forces? <clears throat> okay, so why did I decide to go into the Special Forces in the SF? And this may sound kind of corny or hokey, I think, but the honest answer is, for me at least, I mean, it, it was a calling that I felt. <clears throat> and I would say, you know, it really started um, the summer of 1996. I was actually here at Fort Bragg in ROTC Advance Camp. This is when they still did it here at Fort Bragg. And we stayed out over near Pike Field, um, kind of the old division area, I guess they called it. We had all these World War II style barracks still is where we, where we stayed uh, for six weeks. But anyways, one of the days during advance camp, of course, they called it branch day or whatever. So literally out on Pike Field, for those who are familiar with it, they had all the different branches set up. So the, they had tanks, they had Bradleys, the artillery people had cannons set up, you know, chemical corps people had their stuff, but literally all the different branches of the army had their kind of little booths and stations set up for us to go around and kind of talk to, you know, and they're kind of doing their little recruiting pitch to try to get, get you kind of maybe branch um, into their branch. And so I did that, you know, I went around the horn and was talking to different people and stuff. And out in the wood line on the far side of Pike Field there, they had a special forces ODA that I think was from seventh group. Um, and they were there in the wood line and it was 12 guys and they had all their gear laid out, kind of like a mod demo we would see today, but it was, you know, they're in the woods and, um, you know, they had their weapons and the medical kit and the radios and all this stuff. And I literally ended up spending almost the entire day there just talking to these guys. And in my mind, at the time, I remember thinking, like, these guys must have the coolest job in the world. And then the other two things I was thinking was, well, the other thing I was thinking was, it's too bad I could never do this. And the two reasons why I was thinking that I remember was one, like these guys are supermen and I'm not a superman. So I think I'm a pretty, I've got pretty good potential as a soldier and I'm, I'm in pretty good shape and all this stuff, but there's no way I could be as good as these guys. 
And then the other thing was, I was like, well, even if I was as good as these guys, I had a, I had a serious girlfriend I've been dating for three, four years at the time. We were already planning on getting married. And I heard all these rumors and myths about guys in special forces. And they're always deployed. They're never home. And they get divorced and all this stuff. And it's not good for the family. And so I was like, man, these guys must have the awesome, the best job in the world. Maybe in a different life, I could have done that. But it's probably not going to be an option for me for those reasons. And so that was it. And... Um, so then I ended up, I ended up branching armor, and that's, that's a whole other podcast we could do at some point um, for those who might be interested. But when I was at the Armor Basic Course uh, there at Fort Knox at the time, I remember seeing a Special Forces recruiting sign they had. And I, I would like drive past it almost every day, and I would just see that, you know what I mean? And it kept planting the seed. And I can literally remember uh, my roommate at the time was going through the course with me. We were both planning on going to Ranger School and stuff after done, we were done with the, with the Armor Basic Course there. We decided to stop in to see the SF recruiters to find out more. So we, we go there, and I remember walking in, and, and some of the recruiters, they see us right off the bat, and we ask questions. Hey, how do we, you know, we're kind of interested. You know, what would the process be? And they told us, hey, listen, it's great. Glad you guys are interested. Um, but, you know, you have to be like a senior first lieutenant. You need at least three years in the Army. Like, bottom line, hey, come back after your PL time about three years from now and then talk to us. It's too soon. So we're like, okay. So I finished the course, I PCS to my very first duty assignment, which was Fort Hood, Texas. And I was in an armor battalion there. And it was really was a great assignment. But it was the same thing where like literally every day, like I would drive to work and um, Hood Road, I believe is the name of the road, which is like the equivalent of Riley Road here at Bragg. It's the main artery that kind of bisects Fort Hood. But they had a little SF recruiting sign that was out there. And I think it said something along the lines of, hey, some people have a job, others have a commitment. You know, and it says, see your special forces recruiter. And I drove past that thing every day for like two years. And it just kept, you know what I mean? And I could, I could just feel almost like this gravitational pull, like just pulling me that way, you know. And so I remember going to, I, I needed to talk to my wife because like I've got to get her buy-in first, you know, because I, I knew, you know, I, I had heard things again, like, you know, the commitment that was involved and some of these myths that were out there. So another part of today can be like some, some myth busters to a certain extent, right? But um and so I talked to her and said, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about this. And I kind of laid it out for, you know, what I thought it would look like and what the future may look like. And said, hey, it might be a, a you know, pretty big commitment. And um, but I said, this is what I would really like to do. And we found some other people, um, some other, uh, you know, friends of friends who were kind of NSF that I was able to talk to as well, right? Just to kind of get, hey, what's your experience been? And they were able to kind of demystify a few things, too. And they were basically like, hey, listen, this is some of the stuff you've heard about, hey, super long deployments and all this stuff is not necessarily true. And they're like, in fact, like our experience has been like really positive and we're actually really glad we did it. And so that was helpful. And so, I mean, long answer to your question, but the, I mean, it, it was this calling that I felt the whole time. And finally, it got to the point where it was like, hey. I've got to give this a shot, you know, because I don't want to look back in life and be like, I wish I would have at least given it a try. Maybe I could have done it, you know what I mean? So, Absolutely, sir. And I think uh, a couple of things that you mentioned there are absolutely key. The fact, I mean, that special forces for you and arguably for all of us in RSOF, it, it, it can be and sh arguably is a calling, yeah. you know, for, for the vast majority, if not everybody. Yeah. Um, and that effective product placement really helped yeah. you think about it over the the requisite time that you had to uh, to gain that army experience before being eligible. Right. But what uh, real quick to anyone thinking about it, well, so what did it, what what appealed to me about it, right? Like that day when I was when I saw that ODA from 7th group out in the woodline, I spent all day with them. You know, what captured my imagination was the idea again of like of working on a small team with really highly motivated soldiers, you right, who were kind of trusted and empowered to go into these other regions of the world to do really kind of sensitive, you know, important missions and, and, and with a lot of autonomy to do that. And why? Because you're with a mature group of soldiers, again, who are experienced, um, you know, who are intelligent and can be trusted to accomplish the mission. Again, operating in small teams, you know, like tightly cohesive and just highly motivated. And just the idea of that just really appealed to me. And I, I knew that's kind of the environment and the kind of missions that I wanted to do. I just had self-doubt initially, right? I was like, I'm not sure I have what it takes because, again, in my mind, hey, if you're a Green Beret, those guys are super men. You know what I mean? There's, you know, there's, there's really good soldiers and there's Green Berets. And, like, I'm not sure I have what it takes, you know. So another part of the message later on is, hey, 
never doubt yourself, right? Like you will never know if you have what it takes to be successful unless you give it a shot. Absolutely. And uh, beyond working on that small team, you know, with the autonomy and the drive and the, the capacity of those driven individuals, like you say, sir, uh, it's a capacity or the, the opportunity to have an outsized effect on the mission, as you say. Um, and then the final thing that I was going to note was that family agreement was huge. Yeah. Um, but shifting real quick, uh, as we mentioned earlier, you have an extensive operational career commanding op Army Special Operations Forces, uh, both downrange and at home, sir. Um, and you also have considerable experience here in the Army Special Operations Schoolhouse. So taking your experience uh, that we just discussed on why you came, um, I wanted to ask if you could now, in your current capacity, first talk a little bit about the selection process in general. Uh, could you tell us about the length of the selection courses and maybe a little bit behind the theory of selection? Why do we have a selection process here in RSOF? Right. So, starting up front to answer your question, so we run special forces assessment and selection eight times a year, and it's about it's 24 days long from start to finish. We run civil affairs assessment and selection also eight times a year. It's 10 days long. And then our psychological, assess psychological operations assessment and selection uh, is also 10 days long, and it's run <clears throat> nine times a year. We conduct it, okay? Um, you know, each assessment and selection course is unique, right? And why is that? Because what our assessment and selection programs or our processes are designed, they're a series of tests, right? And so we're, we're testing for people with kind of what we think have the right kind of raw attributes or characteristics that are going to, that are suitable, right, for the branches that they want to serve in. And so the other thing I'll say is this, you know, I think um, it's important when people come to selection, if they don't make it for whatever reason, if they don't get selected, it doesn't mean they're a bad person or a bad soldier or any of that. In fact, it's the complete opposite. Like, first of all, just the mere fact that they were, you know, they got the invite and made the qualifications to even attend one of our selection courses puts them in the top tier of the Army to begin with. So just the mere fact that they're able to attend and meet the basic prerequisites to attend tells us they're in the top, probably, you know, 15% of the Army, period. They're already very good soldiers um, who, come from the, who come from the operational force. We also have, of course, programs where people can come straight off the street as well. But... But again, so our selection and assessment and selection programs and processes are, are really designed not necessarily to look for the best people, but the right people for those branches, right? And so, and it goes back to, you know, you do not have to be an Olympic athlete to make it into SF, you know what I mean? Or to be a rocket scientist to make it into PSYOP or something. We're looking at combinations, the right combinations of physical and mental and even personality attributes, right? So it's the right person that we think is, is suitable and trainable to then go into those qualification course pipelines to be successful. Which goes back to, so why do we have an assessment and selection originally for SFAS, which started in 1988, I believe. So you know, we've been doing it for over, a little over 30 years now. Prior to that, I think you could just volunteer if you made the prereqs and sign up for special forces and you would just show up to the SF qualification course and I think they had about a 50% attrition rate. And as you can imagine, that's not very cost effective or efficient, right? So you PCS soldiers and even families here to go through this qualification course. And then in some cases, within the first few days, weeks, and even months, people are getting dropped from the course and not having to move or PCS elsewhere. So the idea of an assessment and selection course, again, is, hey, let's bring people in. It's kind of like a tryout, trying out for a sports team. Let's see if they have the right qualities and attributes to serve in these branches, in these branches. and then we're going to select these people that we think do, and then now we're going to send them to the qualification courses to get trained. And so we want most of the attrition, the vast majority of the attrition, to take place in our assessment selection courses. So now we found the people that we think have, it's not a perfect process, we know that, right? It's part art, it's part science. We're going we're gonna to send them to the, we're going to select the people with the right qualities and attributes, we think we've got it about right, and now we're going to put them in the qualification course where we can focus on training them because we've identified the right people. Absolutely. From your seat in command, uh, you ultimately oversee all three assessment and selection courses. In your mind then, uh, understanding that it's not necessarily a perfect process, but it's one that's efficient um, 
and finds those right people so that yeah. we can focus on training them, sir. What are the top three notes or areas of focus that you could recommend to prospective candidates uh, coming to selection? Or maybe if those are different, those suggestions are different for each branch, what would they be? Right. So I think this kind of applies to all three of them, regardless of which assessment and selection course, you know, you, you, uh, you know, potential candidate would like to attend, you know, there's, <clears throat> there's really two. It's, and it's all about preparation, right? Physical preparation and then mental preparation. And I would actually say they're intertwined, right? But the first thing we know is hey, all, all of the qualification courses are physically taxing and stressful. The SF qualifi- or, uh, assessment selection course, SFAS, is is more physically intense than the other two, and there's a reason for that based on our missions, right? So you have to be in better physical condition to go to SFAS. But regardless, you've got to show up in pretty good shape. I mean, that number one, that's an attribute that's common to all soft soldiers, right? Is most soft, regardless of the branch they're in, they are in above average physical fitness than a traditional conventional soldier, let's say. And that's based on the nature of our missions, right? A lot of times, we are in you know remote, austere, high risk environments where you've got to be in good shape for a variety of reasons, so that's important, right? So you've, you've got to prepare physically. And what are our assessment and selection courses, SFAS, but even uh, CA and SIP as well, a lot of the physical assessment is used as what? It is carrying a rucksack, right? Usually a pretty heavy rucksack for a long distance over time. So you've got to prepare your body for that, right? To be able to carry a load you know, underweight, a rucksack, you know, over distance for long periods of time and just get used to that, right? Conditioning your feet, your shoulders, your back for that. Um, and running as well. It's, it's, selections are endurance events. They're not sprints. So I'll say this too, you know, you'll be a lot better served, um, you know, training, preparing to run, let's say, five miles at a seven minute and 30 second pace than you would be bench pressing 300 pounds, all right, it's an endurance course, and most the vast majority of the selection courses, where does it take place? It takes place outdoors. It's not in gyms. I mean, lo- really, the only times you're indoors are when you're taking some of our, you know, exams like our IQ tests and things like that. You're taking the psych tests, and when you're sleeping, everything else is pretty much outdoors. So it's probably best to train and prepare outdoors as well, right? Long distance ruck marching, running, building up your cardiovascular endurance, and then of course you do want to work on like upper body strength as well, you know, core strength and those things. Anyways, physical preparation and coming as physically prepared as you can. Then the second piece is the mental preparation too, right? And they go hand in hand. And I think you build mental strength and toughness through hard physical training, right? Yes, sir. They go hand in hand. But then you've also got to prepare yourself mentally for setbacks while you're at, sl- anticipate that things are going to go wrong. You know, you might have a bad day. You may have a bad moment. That's okay. Prepare yourself mentally for that to happen ahead of time and then start teaching yourself when those things happen to let them go and move on, right? Because one of the things our selection process are good at, I think, based on the, oftentimes the physical and mental stress they're put under is it kind of filters out people who don't, you know, can't manage stress well, physical and mental stress, right? Or they kind of crumble under pressure and things like that. So, hey, everybody I've ever known to, myself included, had a, had a bad day at selection, you know? And the key was, I didn't let it get me down. I got over it, I moved on, you know? It's like they say in football, hey, the best cornerbacks have a short memory. You know, if the wide receiver beats you for a, for a 90 yard touchdown bomb, if you let that get in your head, you're gonna get burned for the rest of the day. You gotta let that go and just worry about the next play. Absolutely. So it's the physical and the mental piece. It's all about preparation. And the last thing I'd say is it's about doing your best. The whole time you're there, just, hey, do show up and just do your best every single day. I couldn't agree more with the the intertwining of the mental and the physical. Uh, And to your point about it being a long-distance event, that's that mental resiliency to to move past the short trip ups, the speed bumps, if you will. Yeah, and just for what it's worth, too, for folks out there, they may be interested, you know. So, you know, the very first, you know, what gets people out physically? Well, right up front, interestingly, you know, the day one kind of you know, APFT-like test you have to take, you know, a minimum amount of push-ups, sit-ups, two-mile run time, and then pull-ups, it's sit-ups, actually, that, uh, that soldiers are, are, are not passing, right? And that's the highest failure rate for the day one uh, PT event that they have to take to get into the course. So, you know, working on sit-ups, core strength, 
And some other things that get overlooked too, right? They hate pull-ups, grip strength, climbing ropes, because you'll do some obstacle courses. You're going to have to carry heavy weights with your hands at some points too, right? So grip strength, core strength, all that type of stuff. Again, heavy bench pressing, not really helpful for uh, someone going to selection, you know what I mean, if that's your thing. I it's like Kyle Lamb, my old friend, used to say, hey, I've never been in a firefight and wish I could bench press more weight. It just hasn't happened. But. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, we've talked about the, the physical and the mental attributes are... Um, but is there any more? Uh, if, if you were to discuss surviving selection beyond those two main points of preparation, uh, because another one of the, the, the length uh, yep. over the breadth of the, uh, yep. the, the uh, assessment and selection course, I think without giving away the keys of the kingdom, we're also looking for teamwork, it's, correct? Sir? Yeah, yeah. And it's, I'll say this, right? It is... There are no secrets. There's no secret sauce to passing selection. I would a actually say it's, it's obviously not easy, but it's not really hard either. Number one, prepare. You know, show up, like we talked about, in good physical shape, you know, in good mental shape. So, so come prepared. The second thing is, like we talked about, hey, do your best. On any given, every, every given day, do your best. The third thing I would say is don't quit. Don't quit, you know. Um, yeah, you, you will get pushed to your, you know, some people, you're going to get pushed perhaps to your physical and mental limits. And there may be a moment where you feel like quitting. And it's kind of designed by it, right? Because that's the filter. We're looking to push, to test their resolve, their grit, their perseverance. That's one of the other attributes we're looking for, right? So those people, again, that quit in those moments, that doesn't mean, like we said, it doesn't mean they're bad soldiers. It doesn't mean they're bad people, okay? They're probably, again, really good soldiers. They just may not have that level of determination and resolve that we're looking for to be in special operations, right? So don't quit unless you want to, you know what I mean? If you want to, that's okay too, but that just means you're, you're not best suited right for us you probably make a good soldier doing something else so come prepared do your best every day and don't quit I think those are the biggest three things and to your point with that you know part of doing your best is being a good team player too because we need people that can largely a that are comfortable operating alone in some circumstances but also and arguably more important as a member of what again a small team we all operate, whether it's an SFODA, a CA team, or a PSYOP team. They're small teams, you know what I mean? Anywhere from four to 12 people. And it's a tight-knit family almost, right? Absolutely. It really is. And so, hey, and, and like we all know, if, what, families fight every now and then, right? It's, it's part of being a family, but it, it's a different type of tension on those small teams, right? Because that's what it is. It's more of a family-like environment um, and not a, you know, kind of a toxic type thing. We've got, all got to be able to get along and work together, you know, so we're looking for the people that can work well as a member of a team as well. The other thing I'll say is the key thing I think to being successful is taking good care of your feet. Regardless of what course you're going through, a lot of it is going to consist of having a heavy rucksack on your back that you're going to be carrying for long distances. And so it's imperative that like, you prepare your feet and take good care of them. You, you know, because people, I've been there before. You could be in the best shape of the world. A few blisters in the wrong places can put the most fit person down, you know what I mean, pretty quickly. And now they're no longer able to keep up or move out at the speeds that they need to, you know. And so, like for the NASCAR fans out there, it's like the analogy I make is, you know, you could have a, you could have a type, top five race car for the Daytona 500. And if you blow a tire coming out of turn four on the, on the home stretch of lap 499, you didn't finish the race. You Absolutely. know, you're a DNF. So take good, take good care of your body while, in, in both in terms of preparation and while you're there. Really focus on taking good care of your feet because if you don't, you're, you're going to pay the price. That means, hey, bring good quality socks, like wool socks. Make sure the boots you bring are well broken in. You know, you're not bringing brand new boots for the first time. You may want to bring a pair of boots, at least one backup pair that might be a half size larger than the normal ones you wear because your feet are going to swell over time. And you might, you're going to need that extra space to account for that swelling so you don't get other blisters and hot spots. So those are some little things. And your recruiter should be able, the recruiter should be able to kind of provide some of that information too, you know, in terms of you know, preparation and, and foot care because that's really important. I think your points are, uh, are well stated, sir, obviously. Um, and, and they apply to anything 
really the, that preparation and that dedication of yourself and your mind towards yeah. a goal, yeah. uh, which is exactly what we're looking for. And on that note, Anthony, I mean, one of, what's one of the other kind of qualities or attributes we're looking for? What is people who are self-starters, that have a high level, you know, that have initiative, that don't have to be told what to do, right? They can go out and they know what to do, and they can, again, self-starters, they're intrinsically motivated. And part of that means what? Like, they, they get in shape on their own as well. It's part of the preparation piece, you know, and, and to get historical on assessment and selections, you know, there's this old book that people will refer to called The Assessment of Men that was written by the, you know, the Office of Strategic Services, which of course is where we come from and, and the CIA does as well, but it talks about how, what they, how they assessed people uh, to serve in the OSS. But one of the first things was they called it the quality was motivation for assignment. And one of the ways they measured if a person was motivated for the assignment was did they show up prepared physically? Absolutely. Right to perform in that in that course. And it's that that's just that test of like again like self motivation, intrinsic motivation, and being a self starter. Yes, sir. It goes back to a little bit of discipline as well. Yeah, self discipline. All those things. Those are some of the real qualities that we're looking for. You know what I mean? And again, it doesn't mean the people who don't have that aren't good. People aren't good soldiers, right? We're just looking for a person that has a p above average trait of self-starter, you know, initiative, you know, yes, uh, sir. those type of things. Yeah. So we're coming. We're at 26 minutes. Just okay. So, okay. Uh, so we can use this last question yep. as kind of the closeout, sir. Yep. Um, so uh, getting short on time, sir, if I could ask you one more thing. Uh, and you, you alluded to this at the very beginning, talking about your reason for, uh, for joining, yep. uh, for trying out for Special Forces and ultimately making that cut. Yep. Um, if you could speak to soldiers and even their family members out there who are thinking of joining Army Special Operations but still might be undecided, yep. what would you tell them? Any advice or insights to help that decision? Here's what I would say. Everybody knows Nike's slogan, just do it. Um, I had the same reservations, and my wife did, you know, before, you know, when I was making the decision to attend SFAS back in 2000, and that seems like yesterday. So I was, that was literally 20 years ago. I've been in the Army for a total of 23 years now, and I can say unequivocally, looking back, I consider my decision, in my case, to go to SFAS is the single best decision I made, I've made since I've been in the Army, in terms of career and military decisions, was to come into SF. Um, and all those myths that we kind of heard really never turned out to be true. You know, the qual, uh, again, also, hey, just do it, I'm telling you. And even if you're not successful for whatever reason, it's okay, I'm telling you what, just by giving it a shot, number one, it tells you, you know what I mean, that you're already in the top tier of the soldiers that we have in the, in the Army. And you're going to learn a lot about yourself just going through the assessment and selection course. Whether you're successful or not, I guarantee you, you're going to come out of that a better soldier. You're going to learn a lot about yourself. And it just goes back to being one of those people that, hey, it's better to try something and not to succeed or be successful. The only failure is the failure to try. And I'll, that's, I'll say what we're looking for is people who are actually success seekers and not failure avoiders, right? Yes, and so the people who want, it, who want to go to these assessment and selection courses, you know, they tend to be success seekers. So the last thing I'll kind of say is a vignette, too. I've got a lot of, not a lot, several friends in the conventional army that very, they had thought about going SF when I was going as well. Some of them put packets in and they retracted them. And then later on, they kind of express, express some regret, you know, and I will, you know. And when I look back, I say, hey, well, why didn't they end up giving it a shot? And I'll be honest, the reason was they were afraid of failing. That's why they didn't do it. Right. You know, and again, I'll just say that's a filter in and of itself because those aren't the people we're looking for. We're, we're looking for the people that are willing to give it a shot but are also willing to accept the risk of failure. And I'll just say this. There is no failure if you don't get selected. The only failure is the failure not to try to come to SFAS or either any of the selection courses. Um, the only failure is the failure not to give it a shot. So I would tell them, hey, just do it. That goes you back you to won't your, regret it. It goes back to your point about mental toughness and mental preparation, sir, and that uh, ability to see post-traumatic growth after a minor failure. Yeah. But, uh, yep. Well, sir, I think that's our, uh, our time, and I very much appreciate you giving your time to have this discussion. I think uh, everybody out there listening in our audience would be uh, remiss if they didn't pay attention to all the points that you gave. Thank you again for joining us today on the podcast. Uh, again, for everybody out there, we uh, just hosted 
Colonel Stuart Ferris, the commander of the first Special Warfare Training Group here at the Special Warfare Center and School. If you're looking for more information on the topic, check out our SWIC YouTube channel where we have a soft prep series of videos that specifically talk more about what you can do to better prepare for assessment and selection. Thanks again for your time, sir. Really appreciate it. My pleasure, Anthony. Thank you.